Good morning, everybody. If you are looking for the meeting of the Oregon Housing Stability Council, you're in the right place. We have just opened up our room and uh, in a minute or two more, we'll get things underway. Give it maybe one more minute and then we'll get things going. Okay, let's get things started. Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, August 2nd, 2004, and this is the monthly meeting of the Oregon Housing Stability Council. And as always, we start off with a call of the roll. Thank you, Chair Hall. For the record this morning, council members Defentorum and Mian have been excused from today's meeting. Council Member Farrell. Present. Chair Hall. Here. Council Member Lee. Here. Council Member Mena. Here. Council Member Rogers. Here. Council Member Harris. Here. And Council Member Rodriguez. Here. Thank you. We do have quorum today, Chair Hall. Excellent. My chair's report today is going to be very brief, and I plan to yield most of my time back to Director Bell. Well, when I thought about this, I the discussion we're going to be having later in the meeting about the agency request budget, I was excited and thrilled that our progress is continuing. I also looked back for a moment at 2013 when I was asked by Governor Kitzhaber to serve on the ABC work group. ABC stood for Affordability, Balance, and Choice. And our charge was to propose new ways to fund housing development. And that was the birthplace of the concept for the LIFT program. Look at all the progress we've made since, but we've got to keep a laser focus on what's ahead. Director Bell. Thank you for that. Good morning, Chair Hall, members of the council. Um, again, Andrea Bell, she pronouns, executive director here at OHCS. It's good to see you. Good to see everybody. Uh, I appreciate that note uh, at the top, Chair Hall, and I'll say one positive thing is we don't have to wait too far in the agenda. I think we want to defer most of my time at the top following back up to our uh, conversation in May. So I'll offer just a bit of context uh, back to that conversation, um, commitments made, um, and then also forecasts, sort of forthcoming conversations, both around agency request budget, but also uh, doing so in context of the statewide housing plan. So we know where we fared uh, on the commitments from that statewide housing plan to really help inform where we're going over the next uh, few years. Um, Megan Bolton will join me in that. So as she's uh, coming off screen and getting oriented, one of the things I do want to just anchor us in today is uh, the reality is that it is wildfire season. And as such, uh, that devastation is unfolding uh, in our state. Uh, many of our uh, folks that call and love this state uh, home are uh, experiencing that devastation in Eastern Oregon. And so I want to just anchor that uh, impact, impact, uh, and also anchor us in 
uh, those are uh, collectively our folks as well. So I just want to sort of under uh, underscore no matter what part of the state we live in, whether we're directly or indirectly impacted, the state we call home is uh, going through it right now. And so I want to just anchor us uh, in, in that today. Um, so for uh, to start us off at the top, so just to take half a step back here. So at the May meeting, we had a conversation about how the department in partnership with the council and of course under the direction and in partnership with the governor's office was orienting ourselves into the development of the agency request budget. As part of that conversation, we sort of uh, talked a bit about sort of the fiscal realities in front of us, uh, what, how the uh, fiscal environment has been over the last few biennium. Uh, and then we also uh, previewed some of the few, uh, a few of the investments that we were thinking about to help guide how we want to prioritize what we put our weight behind and therefore what makes it into the agency request budget. Of course, that is all under the backdrop of all of the learnings and all of the things that have went well over the last few years and a lot of the things also defined by the last five years, recognizing that there was sort of a clear stake in the ground of those five years, because we're also uh, pre-pandemic, and if you can call it post-pandemic, uh, that also defined and shaped, uh, shaped that period of time. Uh, within that conversation, uh, we talked about, and I also talked about progress, progress that we are seeking to achieve over the next few years, uh, the reality that we are all insisting on a better uh, housing future for the people that we serve. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to need to, as an agency, not only grow in terms of number of people, apply our learnings in terms of what does it mean to be a, an agency, a department, particularly a government agency that uh, is clearly grounded and anchored in centering race equity. And we want to do that in words and, and in action and in investments. Um, and as part of that conversation, we talked about progress and one of the themes that a couple of council members brought up, understandably so, which is when, what do we mean when we say progress? And so what I want to be able to offer the council today is um, a preview. So the statewide housing plan has that, uh, that period of time has concluded but we also wanna make sure we do it justice as well. So here is uh, our, our intention is today, I wanna to use some of the time to preview some of the um, early outcomes from those very specific metrics within the statewide housing plan. I say initial because uh, in September, the council will have a full and complete and final report out of the statewide housing plan. I am thoroughly looking forward to it. Uh, Megan and her team uh, certainly have no small feet in front of them as we're looking to do this. Um, and as part of that, just to preview it, while we believe that it is important to make sure we're very clear about where we fared on those promises, uh, we also don't want to limit ourselves just to those commitments. And so what the council will see in September within that report is uh, a um, sort of a cacophony of our body of work over the last five years that is inclusive of, but not exclusive to those metrics. We learned so, so much, a lot went right. There's a lot that we look back and we thought, boy, we would do that uh, incredibly different. Um, and so we wanna bring that to the council. So in September, you'll have that report. Uh, as part of the sort of shared agreements that we have, uh, we will then bring that to the October meeting for a more thorough discussion. Uh, and the reasoning behind that timing is simply we just don't want to rush it. We want to make sure the council has an opportunity to review it, digest it, and then we'll have a conversation in, in October. So for today, we're going to give you a preview of those specific metrics within the statewide housing plan. Uh, Megan Bolton will lead that. And then what would be uniquely helpful for, for me is to know uh, if there is any specific feedback that the council has that might inform how we shape that report out. Um, and so whether that's both just visually how we lay it out, how we uh, sort of the appropriate vocabulary that we use to describe and talk about those metrics, that would be particularly helpful for us because this uh, body of work is us, the collective us, and it was done under the direction of the council. And so we wanna make sure your input is uh, reflected. So with that, I will yield back and I will turn it to uh, Ms. Bolton to lead us and guide us through the conversation this morning. 
Great. Uh, good morning, Chair Hall, Director Bell, and members of the Council. Uh, my name is Megan Bolton. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Assistant Director of Research at Oregon Housing and Community Services. I'm excited to bring you some preliminary final numbers on the goals we set in our statewide housing plan back in 2019. Uh, I do want to begin by recognizing just the incredible work that went into the creation of this plan, um, the accomplishments the agency has achieved during the past five years that were laid out in this plan, and the many accomplishments that we couldn't have possibly anticipated when uh, this plan was created five years ago. I also want to thank all the people who worked pretty quickly to help me pull together these preliminary numbers. Uh, I am calling them preliminary, as Director Bell alluded to, because uh, the end date, the official end date of the statewide housing plan was June 30th, 2024. Um, and in some cases, when we do our data collection, we don't actually receive data from some partners until 45 days after a quarter end, which would actually be August 15th, which hasn't happened yet. So, um, so there are a few numbers that still might change after a little more data comes in um, and a, after a bit more time for better review and vetting of everything. So I do just want to kind of put that disclaimer right up front. We worked really hard and did the best we could to get almost everything through June 30th, uh, but there are a few just small little pieces that'll probably still trickle in. Uh, and we do need to do uh, a bit more just general review of all of this. So please keep that in mind. Um, and as Director Bell mentioned, yeah, we will have a more, much more comprehensive review and report out on the strategies and the goals we met, those we might have fell short on, and again, the many things that we transitioned to uh, over the past five years uh, later this year. So today I'm just really gonna focus pretty exclusively on the quantitative goals that were set in the statewide housing plan. Um, and uh, I do have a quick PowerPoint. I don't know if I should share that or if, uh, if Shaloa, if you have that, or if I can share my screen. I think I can share my screen, it looks like. So let's do that. Okay, if you have problems, I can also step in. Okay, is everyone seeing that? Yes, okay. Yes. Okay, I don't know that I can get it into. Let me just do the actual slideshow. Okie doke. One second, so sorry, getting everything. That is not working the way I want it to. Sorry, y'all. Give me one second here. Technology. Yep, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Lost it. Okay, let me try again. You can send it to me too, Megan, if you need to, and I can put it up here. I think I can do it. I might just need to do it from the from this page. Um, so, because it's being weird when I move it to slideshow. So I'm just going to go ahead from this from this uh, where you can see the pane, which is hopefully okay. Okay. Sorry about that. So um, these, uh, we, yeah, we're going to focus our time again exclusively on the quantitative goals. And we will provide more sort of qualitative data in the more comprehensive report out to come. So as you can see here, uh, of the six goals that were set in the plan, we have exceeded our goal on five of them and are about, at about 93% uh, on the sixth. And that is actually when we are, we are only reporting through uh, March 31st at this point. So it could go up. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, and I also just on right here on this slide, I do want to say um, and call out that even though we didn't have sort of one quantitative metric to measure our uh, equity and racial justice priority, that work has been the foundation for each priority and shows up in many ways that we'll talk about a little bit today and more fully uh, in the in the full report out. And to me, I would just say one of the biggest achievements is that we are now at a place where we can analyze data on outputs and outcomes uh, disaggregated by race and ethnicity for all of our programs. And we're actively examining and using that data as we develop and improve programs. 
This was not our reality when the statewide housing plan began and was one of the big strategies within the plan uh, that we that we were striving towards. We have also now have a fully staffed uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion office. We had four DEI committees that are being revamped as action teams that will focus on deliverables for our very first DEI action plan that was recently submitted to DAS. And we've been implementing a racial equity analysis toolkit agency-wide. Uh, and we've invested in training for our leadership and all staff through our partnership with the Center for Equity and Inclusion. Um, and as staff complete their racial equity analyses on their programs, they will be creating equity centered metrics that they will track and report on regularly, bringing us to the place that felt very far away, I would say, when we first started this plan in 2019. And we're struggling to even come up with any, uh, you know, kind of good baseline data on where we were. So again, that's all more that we'll talk a little bit more um, in the full, fuller report out, but Hannah wanted to just uh, call, out, call that out and call out uh, the ways in which um, that has been foundational to all of the other priorities uh, here. So the first priority uh, is around our, our homelessness um, goal. So, or the, sorry, the first goal was around our homelessness priority. And the goal was to increase the percentage of people who retain permanent housing for at least six months after receiving homeless services and to increase that to at least 85%. Uh, our baseline, so when I talk about our baseline, this was the sort of the data that we had for the previous period of time when we were creating the statewide plan, and so used it to sort of try to set some, some ambitious goals. Um, at that time, uh, about 79% of people um, served were retaining housing, and our goal was 85%, and as you can see, our five-year total is at 86%, and in our last two years in particular, we've had pretty high, pretty high numbers, which I think is a real testament to the work the agency and the governor's office has really um, focused on in terms of rehousing, uh, rehousing folks experiencing homelessness. Um, and then moving down to the next goal uh, was permanent supportive housing. Uh, our goal here was to create 1,000 or more units of PSH. And I think you, I think folks should know we reported out that we hit that goal uh, about a year and a half ago, if I'm remembering correctly. And now, uh, as of June 30th, we have made it to 1,689, uh, give or take. We're going to still call that approximate. Um, so very exciting. Uh, uh, getting to that high of a number here, because we know that PSH is a proven model for serving individuals and families experiencing chronic homelessness by pairing on-site individualized services with stable housing. Um, one of the key components to this, I think, has been the investment um, and the ongoing um, investment in the Supportive Housing Institute, which provides uh, training and technical assistance to development teams that are committed to building PSH units. And then I think, again, some of these numbers still need to be better, but I think about 30 teams at this point have graduated from that and have really contributed to these, uh, certainly contributed greatly to these uh, units being put on, uh, either being funded and some now actually uh, on the ground uh, being occupied. Uh, for the affordable rental housing priority, the goal was to triple our pipeline at the time and get it up to 25,000 units <clears throat> by 2024. Um, so we are, I'm excited to say, uh, and I think this is another one that you all probably know, we, we did hit a, a little while ago. Um, and as again, as of June, we are now at around 27,500. Um, so extremely exciting to see that the continued investment uh, from the legislature uh, that, uh, on our funding programs has resulted in uh, this, this type of a pipeline and this ability for us to fund these properties all across the state. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and I think, you know, just looking back when I've kind of looked back on the data to see that I think we were doing somewhere around 2000 units per year, or even a little less uh, in that 2014 to eight, 2018 period uh, to see that we're now at more like four to 5,000 sort of depending on the year. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible and exciting to see. Uh, moving to the home ownership goal, um, the goal here was to assist at least 6,500 households in becoming successful homeowners through mortgage lending products, uh, while also sustaining efforts to help existing homeowners retain their homes. Uh, so 
one thing I will say about this one, a little bit of a, so I show here that we have uh, helped 6,069 Oregonians purchase homes through the Oregon Bond Residential Loan Program, down payment assistance, homeownership assistance, and the LIFT program. Technically, this goal was supposed to primarily be through mortgage lending products, and we thought we would have sort of the flex lending program set up much earlier in the five years than we did. This is one of those things that I would say shifted quite a bit as our priorities as an agency shifted. Uh, so as we move to deploy emergency rental assistance, landlord compensation fund, uh, wildfire uh, recovery funds, um, and as homeownership moved more to the second part of that goal in terms of uh, helping homeowners retain their homes through COVID through the HALF program, uh, that the flex lending program moved back and back a bit. So, um, so if we were only looking at mortgage lending pro uh, products, this this number would be lower at, or, at around 2,500. Uh, but uh, but we have through all of these programs um, ha helped uh, over 6,000 uh, Oregonians purchase homes. Um, so just wanted to kind of call those a couple of things out. Uh, and then uh, there's another home ownership goal, which is focused on. Um, on Black, Indigenous, and people of color and uh, ensuring that we are working to uh, reduce the homeownership gap and the disparities in homeownership and uh, double the number of BIPOC owners in our, through, in our homeownership programs. Uh, so we have, um, we have now, uh, as of, uh, again, this state, uh, this state is actually still, the homeowners data is just a little bit behind, a little bit lagged. Um, so, but as of now, we've helped 2,336 BIPOC households purchase homes through the programs that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and we were only at around 571 uh, before. And I think also more encouragingly, again, this is a place where um, we've been really able to track um, the kind of race, race and ethnicity data through our home ownership data for all of our programs for some time now. And it's, you know, I'm able to sort of see that uh, for each program year over year, we're making uh, improvements in the percentage overall of people of color served in our programs. And the strongest ones have really been, some of the strongest growth has been in the Oregon Bond Residential Loan Program, but we've also just continued to see uh, through the DPA program in particular, how many people of color were able to serve. Uh, and then the final goal uh, in the plan was around rural housing, and we committed to increasing OHCS funded uh, housing in rural areas by 75% or up to, it was a very specific number, 2,543 units. Uh, and uh, this is another one we've really, um, we've really hit, kind of blown out of the water by increasing that number by actually 225%. And we funded 4,719 homes in rural communities. Uh, this includes primarily, that's primarily rental housing, but there's also, we've also funded some lift home ownership units, 128 of them in rural areas. And we've preserved manuf manufactured home park uh, spaces, uh, 431 of those in rural areas. And we know uh, those are critical, um, critical housing types in, in many rural areas. Uh, so I think that's it. Those are those are the goals. Uh, that's where we are as of now. Again, preliminarily, <laughs> I get nervous putting out numbers that haven't been fully vetted. You all know this about me, I think so. But I think we're I, I, I'm feeling pretty good about them. And uh, so uh, and more and much more, uh, I think, to come as we uh, dig in a little bit more. Now that we have these, um, we can, uh, you know, we can start to dig in and, and find some some other uh, nuggets to share with you all. And I, uh, yeah, uh, send it back to you, Director Bell. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Uh, one thing uh, I'll just uh, note and maybe just say out loud uh, before I defer to you, Chair Hall, is as we are looking back at this, it's certainly progress and there's a lot of, um, it is us and the story of us over the last five years. Um, it is also uh, uh, where we see, um, in many ways where aspects of the report also feels dated in this many ways. I think that was one of the reflections where some of the metrics, how we would have set them would have been completely different, where equity and racial justice is its own and it that that would not be how we would have approached it today. And so I think, um, and so I think that's part of having a documented story is you can look back at yourself, uh, maybe like your seventh or eighth grade picture and think, geez, what was I thinking on that day? Um, so, but anyways, I think that is just uh, a helpful note. And then I think, of course, as we move forward, both into agency request budget, 
but then also into what will be the next iteration of, of us. This will be a, a, at least a grounding point. So uh, Chair Hall, I will yield, turn it to you and see if there's any particular questions for, uh, for Megan or, and or for myself before we move along. Thank you, Director Bell. This is fantastic. And I'm just wondering, even with the caveat that these are preliminary numbers, would it be possible to share this presentation with council members? Yeah, we will follow up and send it uh, here shortly, and then you all will have a fully thorough and updated uh, report in September. And of course, we'll be looking for your feedback, if any, to help and inform that, but uh, the short answer is yes. Great. Uh, Council Member Rogers. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Hall. I'd just like to say that being a numbers person, when you measure something, it helps you be able to reflect. And so what you measure is important. And so I just appreciate the, the work mm -hmm. and um, the progress that the agency has made. Thank you. Council Member Lee. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, so exciting, so exciting mm -hmm. to finally see this piece and get ready to put it behind us and move forward, right? Um, so a couple of thoughts. I, uh, Megan, I really appreciate everything you said about there was so much that we could not do five years ago mm -hmm. that we can do now. And I think reflecting on having aspirations, having places that we're trying to go that we're not there yet, it's council member Roger says does move us forward. And so I, I just want to acknowledge that when we see the full report, I would appreciate seeing disaggregation of all of these numbers, both by race and ethnicity and by uh, rural households, because those are the two dimensions where we didn't have, uh, <clears throat> you know, excellent data. And those are our two focuses, right? There's sort of the larger, uh, state of being, and then there are particular communities, both uh, racially and ethnically and geographically, that we wanna be able to tell the story about. And so I think that would be really important just uh, to be able to understand. And, and while we've hit the goals, I want us to go deeper in our analysis, right? So I know that that's what you all are, are gearing up to do. Disaggregation, I think, is important. In terms of the home ownership pieces, I think it's okay for us to say we didn't hit the 100% mark. I mean, generally, you know, in the, and I don't want us to kind of convolute ourselves to say, well, we kind of did because we touched these households, right? If we said a thing and we didn't do the thing, let's let it be. I uh, very much appreciate the attention to uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color home ownership. And even with the gains there, I wonder if there's also information that we could have in terms of the total proportion. Like if we're if we were serving 100 households, what proportion of those households are people of color households and what proportion are not people of house, uh, color households? Uh, two other thoughts. Um, it makes me think that a five-year plan is too long, that that time horizon was way too long. And so maybe we've learned that there's sort of a, you know, sort of an outward place that might be five years, but we come in and focus on the next two, and maybe that's aligned to the biennium. So uh, Director Bell, I see you nodding your head. It's just, you know, we didn't know, and we thought, and it was great to be uh, aspirational. We've done well, but I think, as you said, it feels a little, not tired, but just we've moved on to, uh, the things have changed so much, and we haven't changed that plan. So as we think about moving forward, what is that right time horizon, and how do we want to real uh, dial it in? And then the last thing, I know you're always thinking about this, I think we need to have a big communications plan about this data, mm -hmm. right? It's not often that, uh, you know, an entity, let alone a government entity, and I work for government, right? Like, we say a thing, we're going to do a thing, and then time goes past. Nobody knows if we did it, let alone succeeded at it. And I think in terms of building trust and accountability with our community and legislatures and so on and so on, um, there needs to be a big communication piece about this. And I think the council also needs to play a role in doing that in our local areas and then uh, statewide as you do it. So uh, congratulations, Megan and team for uh, pulling this data out so quickly. And I'm really looking forward to next month where we see the finality of it. And then the afterwards we start to talk moving forward. Thanks. You tell them, Mary. I love it. Okay, Councilmember Mayna. 
Thank you, Chair Hall. Uh, just to follow up on, on uh, Council Member Lee uh, coming on the five year, I, I actually think the five year is actually the right time frame. What I think is because a lot of these projects take time and checking it on a yearly or maybe bi yearly basis, but we do need to have a check in every year, I think. You know, what is the status? What is, you know, where are we up to? And there, therefore, we can make adjustments and, and make, uh, you know, anything that we need to adjust in terms of that. Um, I, I do think in terms of, I completely agree uh, with Council Member Lee in terms of the, the segregation of information so we have a better understanding of uh, where our gaps are, where our weaknesses are, so we can concentrate on those weaknesses and, and also rural versus uh, uh, urban and obviously on the uh, racial basis. And uh, it, it's great data and it's it's great to have this space. Now we have this information and we can see how we improve or where the challenges are as we move forward. Um, you know, one of the challenges I know, especially on the rental part is that we had on the metro area, we had a lot of resources with the Metro bond. Those resources have been spent. And so we're, you know, how do we continue the momentum as we move forward uh, without those resources? And so great job. It's a great report. Thank you. Council member Farrell. Yeah, a lot of great comments that I agree with there. I'm just sort of curious, like where the data source is. Are, are these all data points you're pulling out of um, of HMIS, because I, I feel like I've heard before that it's been hard to pull data on some other projects, and that's like one of our limited limiting challenges. Um, but I'm just sort of curious, like where this data is coming from. Yeah, sure, I can jump in and answer that. Thank you for the question, uh, Councilmember Farrell. Uh, so for the homelessness goal, yes, that data is from uh, HMIS. So we actually asked um, continuums of care to send us their, it's a, actually a system, this particular measure is a system performance measure that they report to HUD. Uh, and we asked that they submit it to us um, uh, for our time period that we were looking at over the years and um, that they actually do it for the whole system, which is a nice thing. So it's for people who enter into our funded programs, but then we're able to see if they've come back into the system anywhere. Um, so that is where that one came from. Uh, and then the others like around permanent supportive housing, affordable rental housing, rural was, is really from our system of record for the affordable rental housing section, which is ProLink. Um, that's where we collect all our data on units funded and are able to report that out. Uh, and um, home ownership comes from, again, I mean, each program has uh, slightly different data sources, but we uh, put it all together. Uh, and that's, you know, if, if folks, uh, almost feel like I wanna add a slide with some of our dashboards too, just because they um, show a lot of this and actually more detail um, over the years. Um, and, and you can see the different programs, which for homeownership is a number of different data sources, but um, most of them are internal or we're getting, again, for one of them, we for like down payment assistance and uh, the uh, homeownership assistance program, we do get data from our grantees, which is where we give them a little uh, time to, to report out to us, so. I can ask just a super brief follow-up question. I may already know the answer to this, but is it possible now? And if not now, is it an ambition that we have that at some point we can track participants between programs in one single system so that we can actually see if we if all of the money that we invested in, say, for example, emergency shelter beds, and then this person got into permit supportive housing, and now this person's buying a home, like that there's a progression? Is that something that you can speak to, or is that like a loaded question? No, it's a great question. I love that question. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. That's one of those things, like it's been a pipe dream, I would say, and it has felt unrealistic, but it's uh, it's something that I think a, a lot of us feel is doable. And we've started to put some structures in place to do that. So we've actually been working with our IT team on setting up a, a Microsoft Azure sort of data instance where we would be able to do just that and we've you know we're sort of starting on small projects where we're bringing maybe just things that were disparate within a division together but I think the ultimate goal um, and it'll take some time but would be just that that we would have sort of a, a data warehouse internally where we could connect the data from our different 
uh, data systems across divisions to start to see those connections exactly as you're saying. I'm not going to, you know, this is all still very, very early. We're still just sort of setting infrastructure up and getting trained on these systems. But, um, but the why we're doing that is exactly what you're saying to, to, to get to a place where we can do that. And it's, and it's certainly, um, you know, it's in sort of some of the um, work we're doing also with uh, our HMIS team has been working also on just general, right, HMIS governance and, and being able to uh, think about how to share the HMIS data more broadly, uh, both within OHCS and beyond perhaps, so. If I can just interject, if you're just starting to have these conversations to consider thinking beyond OHCS, because like I know yeah. OHA has a whole bunch of housing stuff that's coming out. I know um, DHS is doing a bunch of housing stuff. And like for an agency like mine, just sort of representing the service provider spectrum, we have a whole bunch of clients in multiple state systems that we cannot track, nor can any state agency track between those state programs and and that seems to be doable if if the state entities those individual departments all have some alignment or shared priority around that so i realize that might be more aspirational than attainable but i would just want to like plug for yeah. don't just stop at ohcs systems but there's a whole bunch of housing going on in a lot of other areas too and maybe very quickly if i can just expand on that council member Farrell and I see your uh, hand up council member here, so I'll be, I'll be quick here, is um, I actually don't think it is that aspirational. And, and I think that this is the time where we have to take the necessary big swings. And what I mean by that is, you know, each budget cycle, we are asking, generally asking for more of something. I think the other sort of denominator under that, that maybe sometimes feels less exciting, um, you know, than comparatively to some of the other stuff is, as we're asking for more money, also making sure that we have a sharp infrastructure to better tell and illustrate the story of where that money is going, who is being served by them, and how can we better use uh, and better equip communities uh, with data and with information. So I think as part of the agency request budget, I think infrastructure data, infrastructure, again, doesn't feel that exciting, might feel like, why would we put more money into that? versus housing. Well, if we put a bunch of money into housing and then you come back and ask us questions and you know our answers are uh, uh, or kind of this, uh, that doesn't feel great. And it's it's if we're gonna talk about progress, we need to be able to show progress, not just put fancy words around it. And so uh, that too will be a priority for the agency, which is just the infrastructure to make sure we can equip folks. The other thing I'll say very briefly is I think we have something that we do wanna bring to council about how we can also better resource communities beyond money, money's good, uh, and with data, more current data, because we've heard from a lot of folks where either there is not, uh, there's just limited capacity, resources, and infrastructure, and, and we, uh, those are things we can do something about and better equip people with, and we have some thoughts about where we can also be of service in, in that regard. So thanks for uh, centering, centering that. Councilmember Harris. Uh, thanks, Chair Hall, and um, thank you, Megan, for all the information. As a fairly new um, council member, I think I can still call myself new. Uh, this is really informative and helpful to see. Um, I was curious um, in regards to the five-year duration, if there's, if the data could be represented in um, a timeline, visual, or chronologically at all, and mapping out those different milestones and factors um, that heavily influence some of these um, numbers, like such as the Metro bond and really understanding kind of like where the peaks and valleys are throughout the duration. Um, I'm just, I'm a very visual person. And so like immediately I started to think about like how interesting that would be. And maybe that already exists, but um, just something to put out there. Oh, Chair Hall looks like you're on mute. Any further input from the council? Well, I think this has been a great discussion, an exciting discussion. And if I can sum the whole thing up in one word, amazing. But when people are pulling together for a common cause, amazing things happen. All right, we are now on to, I believe, the uh, Affordable Rental Housing Division. And... Let's very quickly go through 
the public comment format. Each person has three minutes to speak and uh, comments need to be kept on the topic of the specific uh, the specific projects involved in this particular decision item. Okay. Are we ready for public input? We are, Chair Hall. Okay. Let's let's start it out with Neil Whitaker. I do not see Neil's name on the attendees list. Neil, if you're via phone only, if you could use the raise hand function of star nine. Okay, I see, I do not see Neil Whitaker on. Okay, how about, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, Sahan McKelvey. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, and I'm here just to speak briefly about the Strong Family Affordable Rental Building that SEI and Community Development Partners are collective or collaboratively embarking upon. And just wanted to share just a um, brief update and a level of excitement that we have in being able to bring this project forward. Um, this is something that is very near and dear to SEI's heart. Um, and we have had success with a few other buildings with our partnership with CDP. So we just have had a building that has gone up that is in leasing right now, the Dr. Daryl Milner building that was also a city of Portland preference policy building on interstate in Alberta. And we have had another piece of this project where we had two buildings on um, Grand and 8th in Alberta, our Ronnie Herndon building and our Paul Knowles building. And in all of these projects, we are trying to shift the emphasis in what happens when affordable housing buildings are erected. And what we have seen and what I think that this body has probably also seen is a lot of affordable housing buildings that are beautiful and they look great and they look like someplace I might want to live. But we have built a building and we haven't created an ideal living experience. And I know that is the goal of our collaborative with SEI and CDP to make sure that we are putting up buildings that are beautiful and putting up buildings that are tenant friendly and putting up buildings that I myself would wanna live in, but also putting up buildings where we are creating a positive living experience. And that's what we want for the people who are moving into these buildings, specifically with our preference policy projects where our goal is prioritized people with a higher preference policy score that have potentially been displaced and are potentially part of the African-American community that SEI is, this, that's who we are, that's who we serve. And so we wanna make sure that we are creating ideal living experiences for those folks. I think we've had a lot of success specifically in the Ronnie Herndon building, which is a family building. As I said, we're just in the lease up process with the Dr. Daryl Milner building and our building towards that and making sure that we're able to create that level of optimal living experience there as well. And that is our goal with the Strong Building. That's been our, our primary emphasis and purpose in all of the design phase and all of the steps that we've taken to get to where we are right, where we are right now. And that's why we're really excited about this project, being able to bring 75 affordable units, um, ideally to folks from our community who have potentially been displaced out of this neighborhood and create an opportunity where not only am I invited to come back to potentially my foundational neighborhood, but I can afford to do so because we know what what some of the 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 steps in in just the past couple of years have created in terms of affordability in that neighborhood. And we want to make sure that our folks are able to have an opportunity that is truly financially accessible to them. And then again, want to make sure that we are creating positive living experiences in the buildings that we are working on. Oh, oh we, excuse me. I'm sorry, but we are past time, so we'll have to conclude your comment. Thank all you. All right, very not much. a problem. I didn't even know what my time limit was, but oh, I, I, I definitely can speak with excitement for as long as you let me. So mm -hmm. that is not a problem at all. Thank you so much for allowing us to share. Thanks. Okay, now Kai Dunson Strain, you're going to lead us through these projects. 
Great. Um, thank oh. you. I guess, uh, Shalo, I just want to confirm that our public comment period uh, was finished. Um, and the public comment is related to both the transactions um, and the ORCA recommendations. That is correct. Those two folks that signed up were called upon. Great. Thank you so much. And um, hello, everybody. This is Natasha detweiler Davy, Director of Affordable Rental Housing. I use she, her pronouns. Hello, Chair Hall, Executive Director Bell, Council members. I'm really excited to be here with you this morning um, and uh, talk to you both first about the um, transactions and then second about the ORCA recommendations, which um, you know, you've been talking about the ORCA for many, many, many months and it is live and now we are making recommendations out of it. So I think thinking about that as swift success is uh, probably pretty notable. I think for context, as we are starting new practices related to the ORCA, a reminder that these transactions is the final rec uh, like uh, required approval from Housing Stability Council to be able to issue the conduit bonds that generate the tax credits. And then the next slate of projects under the ORCA are the recommendations, which as council had requested, we are bringing on the early side so that we can be understanding your feedback early as we walk these projects through the production process. So um, I'm excited to jump into it. I will start my screen share and uh, Ty will um, bring uh, discuss three project recommendations. I kind of love it when software updates and I think you should be seeing my PowerPoint. Okay, um, great, I'll hand it over to you, Ty. All right, good, uh, good morning, uh, Council Members Chair Hall, Director Bell, uh, for the record, Ty Dunson Strain, uh, AD of Transactions, here, here to present three, three projects uh, uh, for, um, um, for, for consideration, um, the first being the the Dolores project in 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 Hillsboro, and we have we have we have two two motions on on the slate one one for one for the the lift uh, lift award that uh, we uh, and and the and the conduit bonds to the the lift this 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 was a lift project it was uh, sub it was sub allocated through uh, through through Metro, and we're just coming back and catch, catching up on the approvals on that piece and the and the conduit conduit bond motion uh for for the project and yeah with that it's a it's a great building 60 yeah, 67 67 units in a in a three three story si single building uh with a mix of mix of afford affordability and 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 unit types and you know there's got there's got some uh, and four bedrooms in here, which we all, we often don't don't see. Um, so um, kudos to the to the uh, ha ha hacienda hacienda teams for you know figuring out the math to make that pencil. Um, that's uh, it's great, and also it also includes units uh, set aside for uh, at at risk uh, folks at risk of being being homeless. Uh, the 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 project is a to total of over over forty. Uh, 40, 40 million uh, uh, million dollars uh, con conduits we have in uh, for for approval over uh, twenty or low, uh, close close to twenty three million dollars and a lift award uh, of of a, a little over a little over two uh, two million uh, two million for close to four hundred thousand. Uh, the project is slated to. Uh, close actually the end of this month. Um, so we're excited about that. And uh, next slide. And uh, Hacienda has uh, has been a, a long long standing pre presence in 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 the in the metro region, serving serving la, la Latino communities for over over thirty years, and they have in in place in place strategies and partnerships to reach. Uh, uh, not not only the the Latino population, but other other BIPOC communities, and uh, they have also committed to um, uh, to meeting our um, meeting our M MWSB participation goals that's uh, set 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 for the region, 
and this project uh, is checks off uh, uh, two two is in alignment with two of our statewide housing plan goals: uh, equity and racial justice, and uh, affordable rental housing. And then the next slide, we uh, tra travel down the travel down the the road down to down to Redmond, and it has a uh, the project Redmond Landing is uh is a a large uh, uh large uh um, 50, 100, 156 unit pro project sponsored by uh Mac mcdonald lad De development llc uh it, it includes a, a range of range of unit types for uh for work uh work workforce uh workforce housing uh, dedicated to uh, uh, we'll be uh, doing outreach to the education employment sector, uh, 13 buildings. Uh, the project is slated to close uh, also this August. It, it, uh, we just have uh, a request for, uh, you know, uh, for conduit, conduit bonds and, uh, and uh, tolling over 30, 37, 37 million with a project. Uh, total close to close to 60 million uh, and next slide. Uh, the prop the, the the project sponsor is uh, is is uh, part is uh, is uh, you know working working in Central Oregon to establish commitments to to long term relationships with lo local partners to reach underserved and 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 by and by pop communities uh they they're currently en engaging right now with um with uh, uh um a couple of couple of key local local partners that are that are, that are named named here uh and they're conti continuing to do uh ongoing engagement with uh with with within the community of uh with uh in, in conjunction with the school uh, uh, the, with the with the uh, public school school board members and and uh, and uh, and and various community uh, community organizations that are that are listed in the packet, uh, they also they also are uh, committed to uh, our our MWSB participation goals and uh, and this project uh, is is aligned to our. Uh, fulfilling our affordable rental housing goals. And the last project uh, uh, is uh, Strong Family. Uh, we, 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 uh, you folks heard her testimony from uh, 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 the, the, the good folks over at uh, S SCI. This is a, a, a co-development co partnership between uh, CDP and, and SCI. Uh, as as mentioned, this uh, the the speaker mentioned this is this is a ongoing ongoing uh, relationship uh, that uh, the the partners have have collaborate collaborated on, and uh, this is well one one of their their next uh, their their next projects that that they're they're partnering on. Uh, the uh, the the project is 70, 75 units. It, it it's uh, located in Portland. It uh, it received uh, received metro metro funding uh, from the, the the city of Portland and also uh, o, uh, we OMEP OMEP dollars and uh, and we're we're here here seeking approval for the conduit bonds of of a little, a little over 40, uh, 20, 22 million eight hundred eight eight hundred eighty. Uh, Eight hundred eighty thousand, and uh, the, with the total project cost of 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 over forty three million, the project is anticipated to close uh, also in August, and uh, it 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 uh, next slide thanks. Uh, it uh, includes a a range of range of in place services that are going to be de designed to. Uh, to help uh, help underserved communities, uh, more, and specific specifically uh, the uh, 
uh, the the African American African American community that uh, SCI uh, population primarily work with, and as mentioned, that uh, uh, they they they've been in the community for over over forty years and have a have a have a desire. Uh, this project is going to be you know, with the preference policy having having desire to have folks uh, return return back to uh, re return back to the neighborhood. Uh, the project sponsors have also committed to reaching our, our MWS, MWSB participation goals. And uh, lastly, the project is uh, aligned with two of our priorities, the equity and racial edge justice statewide, prior, statewide housing plan priority and the uh, affordable rental housing. So with that, I'm open to answering any questions and uh, the uh, and also ask that you can consider consider the resolution that's included on your packet. All right, council questions, input, discussion. Council member Lee to be followed by council member Mayna and council member Rogers. Okay. Thank you, Chair Hall. Thanks, Ty. Um, I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about the discussion with the project in Redmond about their equity and racial justice work. Um, those organizations are not particularly clear to me that they are by, for, and about or serving uh, significant numbers of of uh, people of color. And um, it's also becoming clear to me that uh, setting and um, uh, committing to MWESB goals are very important in the development side of things. And there's a, a parallel piece with the community partnerships and who's actually going to get in, be able to get into the units eventually. Um, so that's more of a reflection for future as we continue to think and talk about how do we understand racial justice and equity and how do we talk about it with each other? Mm -hmm. And so not for now. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about the discussions that have happened and are going to continue to happen with the project in, in Redmond as they move forward. Thanks. Great. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, uh, Ty, and I think, and I know Roberto has also been engaged in this, so I sure. will uh, let them respond to that merely. Yeah, so uh, uh, we, the, so the, the project sponsor, we've, we've been having on, ongoing, ongoing dialogue with the, pro, the, 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 the project sponsor and, and just recently, I guess, uh, Roberto, do you want to touch basis on what 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 recent conversations we've had? Sure. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Hall and members of the council. Executive Director Bell. I'm Roberto Franco, Deputy Director of Development uh, in the Affordable Rental Housing Division. Um, the 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 develop the developer uh, McDonald Lad, as we pointed out in some of the write up has since the beginning has been in these conversations with the school district and some of the organizations that in turn work with the school district. So there is an indirect way there. So instead of going strictly or directly to the organizations, there is that partnership that exists already with the school district. I can think of Better Oregon, for example, that provides a lot of educational related services in the whole region, including Redmond. That, that's one way to do it. And in our conversations with the developer, they are committed to working with community, working with residents and bringing that support. I think that, and this will be reflected as well in, in, in the ORCA, that the partnerships and the relationships and the collaboration that often uh, uh, happens in communities a lot of times they are built overnight, meaning they don't happen just I mean, in a few minutes. And I think it's also a reflection of the work that we do as an agency. When we work with our partners, we like to come and show up in a, in a, in a, um, in a tune of collaboration that is based on relationship. Mm -hmm. And those relationships don't happen overnight. So there, for us, there is also that vision and expectation on our partners that Yes, we want them to establish relationship, but we are not necessarily saying it needs to happen in a month. It needs to happen now. They need to be, they need to have a presence in the community to do that. I think too, and then finally I'll, I'll stop there, meaning that 
when we, for us in the division and, and for the agency, we want to look at those uh, relationships, that partnership and collaboration, really not as a purely transactional approach to the work, because then that takes the humanity out of it. And so we expect and allow and work with our developers to do the same that they go into a community, they establish relationship, work with the community, and really create those natural uh, agreements to work. Some agreements are codified in legal agreements. Some are more in the spirit of collaboration. And so what, what is happening in Redmond is exactly that with the city, with the school district, and some of the other communities that work, organizations that work with Latinos, for example, or with the, some of the tribal members in the region, that will evolve. We have that commitment from the developer to have that ongoing presence and that ongoing engagement with the, uh, with the communities. So I don't know if that helps, but that's the context in which um, this development is happening. And it's also the context in which how we see the, the housing development in the state, meaning it, 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 it's, a, it's a relationship building that yes may eventually or eventually works into some formal uh, partnerships. Uh, thank you, uh, Roberto. It, it, it does help. I appreciate it. I think it's, you know, I, again, I think we're all playing with new practices, right? So as these projects are coming forward earlier in response to our, our request for that, there's more opportunity to say, what is the iterative conversation, the relationship building, and how our staff looking at this now uh, several years relationship that we're about to enter into as the opportunity to push the learning, to have people understand our values as an agency and to be able to support them in moving along that uh, pathway to racial uh, uh, justice and equity. So uh, thank you, Roberta and Roberto. And I think, you know, again, this is part of these, now we have time for these conversations as you continue to work with the project. So thank you. Hmm. Chair Hall, I think you're muted. Sorry, Council Member Mania. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, kind of the same note, the, the only uh, comment I had is that uh, whenever the school district is brought out, at least our, my experience has been that that is very challenging partnership, especially when we're trying to recruit or have communications with families within the school district. Um, that is a very, my experience has been, it's very closed knit that to try to, you know, um, be able to leverage that, that partnership is, is very challenging. And so to me, the words of, put in the words of, you know, working with the school district or working with members of the school board really don't mean anything until there's something in writing that says, this is what we're going to, the school district has committed of doing. Because everything that I've seen in the past that says, yeah, we're working with the school district, we're going to reach out to the school district, leads to nothing. And so that's my only caveat on this thing is that I, unless I, I see something specifically from the school district that says, yes, we're committed to this project, it's important to us, and it, it really falls on, on deaf ears for me. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Rogers. Thank you other council members for um, asking the questions and making those comments uh, specifically for Redmond because I too had questions about that particular one and what it meant about their participation. But uh, the other question that I have is related to the Dolores project. And so um, Northwest Real Estate Capital Corp is involved with that one and they too are, you know, committed to meeting the MWESB target goals. 30% um, participation is aspirational and would be great if they hit that target. I'm just curious is about their past performance with other projects at meeting those goals. I guess I could tell. Um... Data wise on, yeah, so the, the what, what, what we could say, you know, the, the contractor, I think the, 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 uh, uh, the, the general, the general contractor, we fit, you know, I think, 
uh, there's there's a comfort there's a there's a comfort level from the general general contractor side that um, that they've they've had previous previous experience meeting meeting those goals and um, we you know we you know we could we could definitely follow you know, we can definitely follow up and get you some uh, st statistics um, but you know from what what we typically see is the 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 general 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 contractor uh, has uh, has has a broader uh, a broader ability to you know just just because of the the nature of the work uh, reach those reach those targets and then um, the professional services side kind of fill, fills in uh, fills in a smaller proportion um, but the 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 the, the, the contractor uh, typically. Uh, you know, feel, you know, there, there's uh, the the bulk of that is uh, is is made up of of uh, actually hard hard cost hard cost services uh, versus versus professional services. But um, um, if uh, Natasha and Roberto wanna wanna add add to add to what, what any any gaps that I miss, I'd... I'll just add again. This is Roberto Franco. Um, I'll just add that. It's it's Hacienda CDC, the developer and their general contractor, whom we would hold accountable for reaching that data percent. And for this particular project, and well, actually in any of the projects now for the last three years, we do get co uh, now beginning quarterly report. I take that back. I'm sorry. We get regular reports from the, the activities in the MWSB. At the beginning, when we uh, close the financing, there, there is a, a, a benchmark that, that developers will need to meet. At 50% of construction and development, we come back to see where they are uh, in meeting that percentage. And then at the close out, when everything is done, we get a final report uh, from, uh, in this case, it's gonna be from Hacienda and the general contractor, uh, uh, to give us where, where they were. So there is that way that we can monitor their progress, make sure that they're still meeting that 30% or higher. And uh, Ty is right, we can, we can get you some additional information about what Hacienda and their contractors have done in other previous projects. Okay, thank you. For, for our understanding, we believe that the, the, that they have met and met or exceeded goals in the past. But I think, again, there is some reporting lag um, that is also part of it. Councilmember Harris. Thanks, Chair Hall. Uh, quick question. I was hoping if you could clarify uh, the cooling strategy in Redmond Landing, um, specifically if there's uh, air conditioning in the units. It doesn't say, um, I don't believe it says in the packet, and I'm sorry if I missed it. Yes, air air conditioning for let yeah I think air conditioning is is going to be uh, the 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 in uh, uh, wall units, but I will uh, I will uh, check check in real quick with see see if staff uh, see if staff may, might have some up, updates on this if it's a P tech unit versus a wall unit. Um, if uh, if 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 I could yeah you know, take a look and take a look at the pack, I think it's I think it's uh, all uh, you know all kind of wall wall uh, wall units, but um, I'll, great yeah I appreciate just that check. yeah yeah I just want to make sure it was accounted for I um, I think I've mentioned this before, but I think that's an important part to include if we can on these summaries going forward. Um, because if it is, I feel like it's kind of um, uh, life-threatening at this point if AC isn't included in units. And um, so it'd be great if we can include. So appreciate that. Great. Thank you for the, for the note on that. Any further comments, questions, discussion? If not, I'd be ready for the motion uh, on page seven of the packet. So moved. Thank you, Councilmember Lee. And is there a second, please? 
Second. Thank you, Councilmember Rogers. Now we'll call the roll. Thank you, Chair Hall. Councilmember Farrell. Approved. I'm sorry, what was that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Chair Hall. Yes. Councilmember Lee. Yes. Councilmember Mena. Yes. Councilmember Rogers. Yes. Councilmember Harris. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Great job, everyone. Great. Now, rolling right ahead. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, Chair Hall, Council, and um, I, we have gotten confirmation that it's through the wall AC forced air for that Redmond project. So as a follow through on that. Um, so really excited um, to be bringing uh, this next item, the ORCA recommendations um, to you today. Uh, and I'm going to uh, share a screen and hand it over to Amy Cole and Roberto to lead this uh, conversation. Oh, Amy, you're muted. You're not muted, but we cannot hear you, but it does show connecting to audio. Try again. Nope. Now. Yes, there you go. <laughs> I was joined by phone, but it was giving me problems. All right. Good morning, Chair Hall, Housing Stability Council members, and Director Bell. I'm Amy Cole, the Assistant Director of Development Resources, and I'm very happy to be recommending the first two projects from the ORCA process for funding today. Next slide, thank you. Um, so just a little refresher about the ORCA. Um, we, we did a soft launch on May 8th for a few projects, which helped us kind of understand our processes better um, and make some tweaks before we launched um, our ORCA materials on May 28th. Um, we held a training on June 6th. Um, that training is posted on our website and the applications team continues to hold office hours every other week um, since that training was held in order to offer um, assistance and answer questions uh, for applicants or prospective applicants. Um, on June 12th, we opened work centers to receiving application materials for the impact assessment and our current impact assessment um, stats are that we have 18 projects in impact under review and including the two that are coming to you today. Um, and then we have 80 projects in the impact assessment step, which means um, they're at various stages of completing their application. Um, we have 39 for-profit led projects, 44 nonprofit led projects, and 14 housing authority led projects and one tribal led project in that pool of 98 overall impact assessment applications. Sorry, applications. Next slide. Um, here's a visual representation of where all of those uh, projects that have applications in the impact assessment step are located throughout the state. Um, it's, there are quite a few, and we are excited that they are from all over the state. We have quite a few in the central uh, part of the state and also the eastern part of the state, as well as along the coast and um, in the I-5 corridor. Next slide. All right. So... Um, You'll remember from prior presentations probably that the ORCA has an intake um, and then three steps, impact assessment, financial eligibility, and project commitment. Um, after project commitment, projects move to financial closing and begin construction. And I'm going to be focusing on the impact assessment step today. Um, so, um, projects that we're bringing you to you today were reviewed for completeness to ensure they meet all impact assessment evaluation standards and expectations. Those are 19 items. Um, 
The review highlights include uh, site readiness, estimated project budget and costs, plans for MWESB, trades in development and construction, strategies for housing and serving future residents, development team eligibility and capacity. All right, next slide. So the projects today that we're gonna uh, look at today are Lighthouse Village Apartments and Short Stack Belmont. Both of these projects were part of our soft launch and um, yeah, we're excited to be bringing them to you today. Let's look at Lighthouse Village first. That next slide, please. Thank you. Um, Lighthouse Village is located um, in Lincoln City, or will be located in Lincoln City, 28 units. The sponsor is the Housing Authority of Lincoln County. Um, there is a focus on serving people with severe and persistent mental illness, and the project will have a partnership with uh, Lincoln County Health and Human Services. We are recommending this project to be funded with LIFT. Um, and next slide. Okay. Um, the Housing Authority of Lincoln County has strategies and plans and partnerships to reach and serve and work with uh, people in underserved communities. Um, they have an MOU with Lincoln County Health and Human Services as the service provider for tenants. Um, and the focus is to serve persons with severe and persistent mental illness. Lincoln County Health, uh, Health and Human Services has in place cultural competency policies to provide culturally competent services and to be a culturally competent workplace. Lighthouse Village also um, has plans for referrals to local culturally specific service providers. Um, they work closely with Central de Ayuda of Lincoln County and are in conversations with the NAACP. Um, Housing Authority of Lincoln County and their general contractor commit to reaching their MWSB participation rate. They are aware of what the expectations are and have plans for reaching their goal. And um, as we discussed earlier, OHCS will monitor their progress throughout construction. Next slide. All right, our second, um, second project for consideration today is Short Stack Belmont Apartments. This will be 35 units. The sponsor is Short Stack Developer LLC. Uh, they are located, or the project is located in Portland, and we are recommending Lyft and OHTC um, as the OHCS resources for this project. Next slide. Short Stack Developer LLC has strategies and plans in, plans in place to serve um, underserved BIPOC and refugee community members. They have entered into a memorandum of understanding with the Somali American Council of Oregon to, who will provide a wide array of resident services to meet the needs of the resident community. Um, and um, as with the other projects that we're recommending today, um, this developer and their general contact, contact contractor, excuse me, commit to reaching MWSB participation. They know the expectation and we will monitor their project, their progress during, uh, during construction. Next slide. All right. Um, so if approved for funding today, these projects will receive a letter of interest from OHCS and we'll move on to the next step of the ORCA process, which is the financial eligibility step. And here's just sort of a visual representation of the steps as projects move through the ORCA process. So we're currently at impact assessment, and then it would be financial eligibility if projects make it through, when projects make it through financial eligibility, they get to the commitment process and then financial closing and construction. All right. Next slide, please. All right, happy to answer questions. 
um, and ask that you consider the motion on page 20 of your packet. Well, I'll start off by saying I'm excited about both of these properties, um, especially the one close to me in Lincoln City. Uh, this is a great partnership and uh, badly, badly needed. We haven't been able to get more housing for people with severe and persistent mental illness for many years, and this is going to go a long way toward meeting that need. Other council input, questions, comments? Council Member Lee. Paul, uh, this is not specific uh, to either of the projects. I would just love to hear a little bit, either Amy from you or Natasha, about uh, interesting things you've learned uh, now that we've, you know, we did all this work, we put it together, we're now like moving, which is like, ah. Um, and uh, any interesting things that that you've learned, either like, oh, we got to watch this, or oh, this is working exactly how we envisioned, or it's not, but it's like, what? I'm just uh, interested to hear more about your reflections on the process. Yeah, well, I can start with that from my perspective. Um, I supervise the team that is reviewing the applications in the impact assessment process. And so I think we've learned a lot about um, just uh, implementing the standards and how to do that in a consistent way. Um, we've also seen just, you know, some really great projects and we're just you know, it's just been exciting to see all these projects come in, as you can imagine. It's just one of those things that like, wow, this is very amazing. Um, and I think, um, you know, we just, we're just really refining our internal processes so that, you know, um, we're comfortable with the new way of doing things. And also, um, you know, answering questions. And it's been really great also to be able to ask sponsors for additional information, right, and clarification and kind of have that back and forth with them instead of, you know, with the NOFA process, it was just so hard for both sides, right, for the applicants and then for staff as well to just have to say no when if we could have asked for some clarification, we probably, you know, would have, we would have been able likely to move to move forward with some applications. And so um, I'm very appreciative of that, of the new process and being able to have that back and forth and clarification. And that part is working really well, I would say. Great, Council Member Rogers. Sorry, I had to find my uh, unmute button. Uh, anyway, thank you, Chair Hall. I am um, interested in learning more about the um, Lighthouse um, Village project and the uh, contract requirement that O'Brien Design Plus Bill has with another emerging uh, business as far as um, what works with that, if that's something that um, could be talked about with some of the other um, housing developers and, and how to increase participation and reach uh, underrepresented businesses and moving forward and helping lift smaller businesses up. So um, thank you and I'm happy to get some additional information from the from the sponsor about that. And um, I think we can definitely also continue to get feedback from the sponsor as they start construction, which hasn't happened yet, obviously, um, just to see how that how that partnership it is working and if they consider it a successful model, you know, we can we can definitely have some more dis discussion with the sponsor as the project moves forward. Uh, this is Roberto Franco. Uh, if I may add just something quick to that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, as we continue to evolve and make our MWSB and work better, uh, we can have the opportunity to bring 
groups like O'Brien design and build to, to share in the context with other developers in the context of other general contractors and how this can be done uh, in, in the early years. Well, actually last year we, we, we began, but we had to take a pause on, uh, on, on this because of the other work that need like the work <laughs> research, but we began gathering, uh, in, we did this in Southern Oregon, for example, where we gather general contractors, some developers, and have that shared learning opportunity from others that, to see how they're doing it or how they did it, the challenges that they face. So I think we could envision as we continue with the MWSB as a, as a workforce effort to bring that opportunity of learning as well from those that have succeeded in different areas. Uh, O'Brien is, is one of the groups. I think there are other groups that have also figured out how best to do this, and we can certainly create that opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I think it might be the first time that O'Brien have seen their, their involvement in something like this, but we can definitely uh, have them in mind and, and figure out how best we can utilize their shared, their, their experience uh, with other developers as well. Thank you. Okay. Any further council input? If not, I'd be ready for a motion. So moved. And a second? Second. And a roll call, please. Thank you, Chair Hall. Council Member Farrell. Yes. Chair Hall. I think I should abstain in an abundance of caution since Lincoln County Health and Human Services will be the primary service provider at Lighthouse Village. Thank you, Chair Hall. Duly noted. Councilmember Lee. Yes. Councilmember Mena. Yes. Councilmember Rogers. Yes. Councilmember Harris. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Thank you. Can I just add something quick? Of course. Okay, uh, Chair Hall, uh, now that we've brought to you and shared this couple of recommendations through ORCA, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, it's as a way of reflecting, I mean, it's a milestone for us. I mean, we've been at this, started about, about a year, we starting about talking about ORCA. And so my, having this milestone, sort of halfway to see the completion of the steps and the new process that we have, it's a great opportunity in interacting with you at these early stages of any, any of the funding applications. And that goes meaning with the gratitude, uh, starting with our staff that have been working since then and now, having established, for example, an applications teams, it, it the flow that how we see in applications is a much better flow that, uh, because there's a team working with us and working with the resources team to make sure that we're not missing something. So a great appreciation to all the staff that work here from, from operations, policy planning, our, our procurements, and IT, anybody that has helped, and certainly our external partners and you, the council, that help us walk through these directions that we needed to go, and the many development partners that engage with us over the last seven, eight months to see where we are now. We're not done because we still need to go through the financial eligibility to see how that works in, in this new process. But I think it's a, it's, a, it's a reflection that we, as an agency and as a division, we're always trying to live up to our values of adapting to new opportunities and new challenges. Within that, also look for accountability, meaning we're holding ourselves accountable in responding to our partners through the ORCA vice versa, we're hoping and encouraging them also holding that accountability that your project, if your project is ready, show us, let's work together, let's move it forward. So uh, there is more to learn about it, but I just wanna share publicly the appreciation to the staff and uh, upside partners and many of you that work with us through this process. So there'll be more to come. These Dr. Are Bell the best and his team person. council members. All right. My name is Keeble Gistel, and I serve as Director of Home Ownership. Oh, it Hi. looks like we've got somebody that's unmuted. Oh, there we go. I think we're good to go. Okay. My apologies for interrupting, uh, Roberto. No, I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'll, no. I'll wrap it up there, but I appreciate uh, the, the work and the support in getting us where we are now with the ORCA. 
Thank you, Roberto. I wish I had huge confetti cannons. It feels like a confetti cannon moment on a number of these issues, but really with this one, I uh, cheers to everyone. It's amazing. And I'm looking forward to, to, to more. Absolutely. And uh, I won't bother reiterating something that I think Roberto represented amazingly. And uh, again, gratitude overflowing. And I think I will just pick this up to transition to our next agenda item, which is a discussion on more ORCA things related this time to tax credits. And I think um, if you recall um, the conversations that we've had over that last year of work that has resulted in those projects that you've uh, approved today, um, we stood the ORCA up um, with a focus on the gap resources that we had uh, available, meaning the lift resources, lots of complicated funding, um, but we knew we had a little bit more time before we needed to address the low-income housing tax credits in the room. Um, these are complicated resources. There's lots of different requirements to them. Um, and we knew we needed, we wanted to align into the ORCA and that taking a, that would take a little bit more of a different conversation to figure out how to do it. And that essentially deciding what the ORCA meant to us was the first step. And now we are in a place where we are needing and wanting to move into incorporating the low income housing tax credits into the ORCA. Um, and so I just am uh, work of uh, Amy and Mitch and I and Roberto here today to be able to kind of kick off this discussion, just really wanting to carry through and start that conceptual conversation with you all so that as we are um, kind of trying to streamline this over the next uh, few months, we will kind of make sure that we are um, walking on that together and um, in line with what your thoughts and expectations are. Um, so just going to have a brief presentation and then mostly hoping to focus on discussion and some various program areas. Um, first, we'll do a little bit of an overview of the low income housing tax credits for some ground setting, um, go through some opportunities for incorporation into the ORCA and uh, overview some next steps related to that. Um, so again, there's some all of you have different relationships with housing and housing finance. So the first little primer on um, tax credits, this is an indirect federal subsidy used to build rehab, affordable rental housing. Um, and it's indirect because what it is is a federal tax credit. So a, a tax credit is provided, it is claimed over 10 years by an equity investor who gives money to the project in order to recoup uh, or get that tax write off and their taxes over that 10 year time period. There are two different types of credits. There are 9% tax credits and 4% tax credits. Traditionally, a 9% tax credit is estimated to cover about seven, the equity generated from that tax credit is kind of conceptually covers about 70% of total project costs. And on 4% tax credits, that's closer to 30%. Um, and it's the 4% tax credit that requires that 50% of the project costs are covered with private activity bonds in order to generate the tax credit. And that is different than in the 9% tax credit where there's no need to use that specific debt service to be able, or debt structure to be able to generate the tax credit, but instead it's allocated to the states by uh, the federal government. There is the qualified allocation plan, which is the document, the policy document and process document that is required by the IRS in section 42, where you outline what you need, how you're going to use the resources. And so we generally for other state programs do this through state policy manuals, program frameworks and administrative rules. For tax credits, we have this document called the QAP. Um, and so this process of aligning the 4% and 9% tax credits is in action, updating the QAP so that we can do that. So it's really um, kind of balancing all of that into that policy document. Um, at this point, both programs, both the 4% and the 9% tax credit are oversubscribed. We tend to have more interest in the resource than we have available resources to fund projects. 
Um, by, by federal statute, section 42, the 9% low income housing tax credit has requirements for a selection process. So it will say you need to consider these, these, and these as you're selecting which projects to use um, the resources. Historically, we have done these as standalone NOFA. So we would do a 9% NOFA. Um, and so this is again, wanting to make that 9% offered through the ORCA as a difference. The 4% tax credit requires an allocation process, not a selection process. However, while it had traditionally been non-competitive, it became oversubscribed. And um, due to the availability of private activity bonds, again, as long as you can cover half of that cost with private activity bonds, you can generate the credit. So the real cap, the real limit on that is not how many 4% the state is allocated, it's how much private activity bonds is available to finance affordable rental housing. So as that resource became oversubscribed or was identified as oversubscribed, um, you, for those of you who have been on the council for a couple of years, you have also navigated that conversion along with us. Uh, we stood up an interim prioritization process that included priority for hou housing authority projects, as well as those projects with significant local fundings including the Metro Bond resources, which was relying heavily on that 4% tax credit. So right now we have this opportunity to align both of those programs into the ORCA so that it can leverage all of the same things and elements that we were just talking about in the last presentation where we are able to do pipeline support, understand um, support balanced with accountability, wanting to make sure that we're deploying those resources to result in housing in the community. So first, I'll just kind of touch on 9% um, tax credits, and then we, I'll pause so we can uh, have a little discussion. So this is the 9% tax credit that has a required selection process, traditionally had been a standalone NOFA. Um, as we are thinking about this and looking at what are the ways and means for aligning into the ORCA, these are kind of the, the ideas that we have and are kind of wanting to understand are these uh, matching what your thoughts and expectations are. Are there other thoughts that you want to make sure to raise at this point so that we can be responsive as we continue these discussions with you? So firstly, um, we did a lot of work with uh, on the process and uh, ORCA development about instead of doing scored things where you are outscoring based on this or that, that we are, have a strong standard and we hold the standard across all projects. And so as we are thinking about bringing these tax credits into the ORCA, um, we are hopeful and, and seeking to do strategies that are not duplicating or changing what a standard means to us, but applying the same consistent bar of evaluation for feasibility um, and alignment with our resources through the ORCA. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, second item there, um, the 9% tax credit traditionally, we had, you know, traditionally covers about 70%, the equity covers about 70% of total project costs. And traditionally, we have not paired that with per unit subsidy. So we've given it a modest amount of more flexible resources around like $500,000 to be able to do some, uh, to ease the financial kind of flow of funds through the course of the project, but not the you know, 100,000 per unit or the 200,000 per unit that we do with 4% and other projects. And I think there's an opportunity where if we did choose to pair per unit gap subsidy with the 9% credit, we could maybe give a lesser amount of credits and get bigger projects financed and essentially get more units from the resource by allowing that pair pairing. And I think given that feels um, in my perspective, very reasonable step to make at this point in time when we have an oversubscribed 4% program, we have a legislature investing in incredible um, uh, gap subsidy. So we have resources that we could effectively leverage into that to get more units from the whole. Um, and so that's a policy decision. And I think, again, we're I'm working towards supporting that, but I want to make sure that we are um, hearing that as well. From um, So there's ORCA standards. We also established ORCA set-asides. And so those set-asides for 25% for culturally specific and 
um, rural organizations and the remainder is geographic attributions across the state. Um, and um, hoping that we are aligning our 9% program into that same structure, acknowledging that there are a couple other priorities in there and that 10% is de dedicated in our nine, existing 9% program to tribal housing. And again, that is another set aside category that we could align to in the ORCA. Um, and then a 25% preservation set aside, which we could again put into that um, funding category within the ORCA as well. So again, wanting to merge those into the ORCA structure versus creating a new evaluation or aspect around that. Um, and so then, so those are, I'm going through a lot of things and I apologize as I'm talking and realize it's a lot. So I will pause in a minute. Um, next at, though is, so that's all like kind of standards. How are we allocating resources? Again, really wanting to rely heavily on the ORCA. And then how though, because there is a selection process needed, we will have more interest than is, is able. The uh, section 42 doesn't, um, tells us we need to select them. It doesn't say that we do a, can do a rolling aspect around it, just around readiness. So we want to have a place to be able to meet that requirement that lets us select projects in a way um, that is early and not having projects do all of the work of getting the project ready before we tell them if we're going to let them use the resource. Um, and so in thinking about that, our, our um, kind of noodling and uh, around a strategy where we have some upfront thresholds around being eligible for those 9% tax credits, and then a process to prioritize using some um, more uh, objective measures. So we have all of the things and then all of that before we apply the ORCA standards, before we do that full evaluation. So we're doing some upfront, kind of more simple, well, detailed threshold analysis to make sure that they are a good fit and are uh, aligning to address needs, are you know committed to doing and will meet all of the ORCA standards, but that that evaluation is more threshold based and then having selection criteria in there and um, and then that and that really then cues up a conceptual place to say if we are looking at all of these projects that could potentially use this credit, what is the thing that we want to make decide what what our priorities and what our what order that goes in? Um, we have an executive order on production, so um, the number of units. So the more units conceptually could be the a choice to say we, you know, all else being equal, these all meet these thresholds, but this one creates more units. That could be a decider. It could be uh, um, ranked with that in consideration, as well as where have we seen tax credits go before? What is the community need? How do we align with the Oregon housing needs analysis? And, um, and those types of more objective standards. And I think I want to just call out that um, objective standards means that we are able to have a clear list that clearly ranks and spend a whole lot less time debating the nuance of the words. And is that a, a you know, anyway, is that, does that word mean something bigger or better than that? Or was that just really well written? And I think doing the thing of subjective scoring of essays and narratives becomes a place where, um, it has a little bit limit in impact, I think, over time, because you either become really good about writing it, or um, we get really twisted around how we are going to hold accountable to the words when those aren't measurables exactly. So I think I'll maybe pause there. Um, and I know, again, that that was a lot, but I think conceptually, again, around aligning to the ORCA standards and process, and then what is it that we want to be prioritizing as we think about that selection process? Okay, we'll hear from Council Member Farrell first and then Council Member Rogers. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, so this is just a question maybe based on, maybe based on um, speculation. I don't have any reason to think this is an actual fact, but I'm hearing you say that the ORCA applications will be prioritized based on objective factors related to community impact. So is it a true statement then that there will not be some prioritization based on 
getting your application in early. So like people who just sort of got them in really fast won't have some sort of prioritization over applications that might come in later that then are more in alignment with the community impact priorities. Yeah, and that, that's a great question and I will um, give an answer. I don't know, Mitch, if you have other thoughts to add in as I um, think about it from my perspective. And I think um, because what we are, the, you know, the ORCA is really aligned to, you know, when you are ready, we are there to be able to move it through and to make those commitments and, and do that. Because we have to evaluate projects that want to use the 9% tax credits and select them, we would need to have a, if you want to use this resource, submit your intake application by XYZ date and fill out this information so that we can do that ranking. And I think that to, um, that that provides clarity for everybody about when they need to have that information submitted and it isn't going um, to disadvantage somebody who needs that whole time to be able to submit it, but that instead anybody who is in there and if they've gotten it done early, that's fine, but we will say, you know, on July 1st, right? that's the fake pretend date, so nobody use that date. But on this date, we will look at everybody who has submitted this information that we need to evaluate it. Um, and then once we make that kind of decision from that upfront ranking and, and list, they would go into the ORCA impact evaluation assessment that um, would let us do the more detailed um, diligence around the policy work that they are doing and work it through the process that way. Does that, any other thoughts to add to that one, Mitch? Uh, not really. I think that yeah, the the time period of it being open is is very you know reminiscent of the work or the NOFA uh, process that we used to have, which you know we are trying to move away from. I think the big difference is sort of what Natasha mentioned earlier uh, of this kind of early screening threshold process. So we're not going to require uh, organizations to submit their entire impact assessment application, take on all those pre-development costs that are required at that point if they don't have a good chance of getting this resource, which I think will help some of those organizations that maybe aren't quite ready to pursue a 9% tax credit to think about other opportunities, maybe work with us to through the ORCA process to kind of get lift or another kind of resource in that way, or we can help them prepare for the next uh, release of 9% credit. So I think it's a little bit more collaborative. It's early on, and it will hopefully help some of those um, yeah, some of those applications that are going to take a little bit longer. Councilmember Rogers. Thank you, Chair Hall. So um, the the orca, the earlier presentation that we heard, it sounds exciting. And just based on feelings, it feels really good. Like, you know, the flow is working and everything. I think that I would like us to um, work through the ORCA in completion with our project um, kind of test run before launching the 9% um, into that particular process. I think that it's good to, to move it in that direction, but I think I'd just like us to make sure that all the kinks have been worked out before, you know, doing both of them at the same time. Um, thank you for the clarity about there would be a timeline for applicants to submit their applications. And I would need more time as well to kind of think about what sort of objectives to, to use to, to rank the applications, but I like the fact of, you know, getting people involved in the process earlier so that if they're not a good fit for the program and we could help steer them into another type of alternative financing, I think that's really great. So thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate that, um, uh, Councilor Rogers. I, I think in terms of the timing of putting the resources through the ORCA, there is a 
risk that if we don't um, incorporate these resources, we will lose the credits to the state. And so there isn't a lot of uh, flexibility there. If we're going to deploy the resources and put them to projects, we need to be funding new projects with the resources. Um, and I think it would um, do our systems a disservice to disconnect from the ORCA. So I think we have recommendations from this that will allow the ORCA to continue to test out the rest of its functions. Um, and I think what we can also be sharing as we you know, shared earlier um, today, the all of the information from those that have submitted impact, not impact, um, intake applications. We have dozens of projects that are it, waiting, have submitted their interest through the intake process and using tax credits and are just holding, waiting for us to be able to put the resources into the ORCA to be able to follow through in the process. So I think um, there is a real opportunity that we have to be able to do this and in a way that will build off, um, again, how, uh, like understanding how we will end up prioritizing, we'll start to inform, provide, give the, all of those projects on desks, um, information and insight about whether they should continue to target that tax credit program for financing their project or if they need to look at other strategies if they're not naturally going to um, be a top priority or prioritized project through this um, this incorporation into the ORCA. Thank you. Appreciate the, your comments. Okay, Council Member Lee. Thank you, Chair Hall. Uh, Maybe this is a little bit of uh, in the direction that Council Member Rogers has uh, was just raising. I uh, so this is interesting. It's a big change. It's uh, you know uh, swimming where we haven't swum before. I know you all do a lot of community outreach and engagement, and I'm interested to just hear a little bit about what the developer and other partners think about this, because I know there's a real, there's always been this tension between the 4% the and the 9% and who gets them and who doesn't and what's required and what's not required. So I'm just, I'm curious about what we've heard um, from our partners say. Uh, I wanna say that I support uh, uh, Natasha, this framework of there's a strong standard and it is the standard for everything. Uh, I like that quite a bit. Um, I do wanna say that, uh, uh, I'm in support of that. I'm a support of a template that helps staff people be able to evaluate and discern as consistently as possible across themselves and, and, and the organization. Uh, in terms of racial justice and equity, there isn't any subjectivity. I want to be really clear about that. Um, there is um, uh, there is only um, because we're bringing our own lived experience and lenses to it, an analysis within a structure of white supremacy, it's very difficult to say, well, I can, when I say racial justice and equity, we all know what that means and it's evidenced by these three statements or these three uh, conditions or environments. I think uh, this idea of having sort of a subjective tool that would allow us to, um, you know, rate or understand or discern uh, doesn't hold up when it comes to racial justice and equity. And so I think this continued work that you're doing with Chelsea and and, and the REIT will be really uh, important as you go through that. And then finally, I want to say I, I strongly support this direction that we're going in, which uh, looks to uh, put set asides to the funding that uh, raises up our values. And then if we don't have the response, we think it's able to be then repurposed into the general uh, usage and general population. And I think that's a that's uh, that's a great model. So um, I'm willing to take a little risk here. I'm curious to hear what our partners have said about it. And uh, thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, all I think that all resonates very strongly and I think will be helpful as we continue our conversation to make sure we're hitting on, on those points. In terms of um, broad stakeholder engagement to um, we are, I mean, I think this is our first convert, like I think wanted to make sure that we are understanding your perspective before we get specific and discrete feedback on this. That being said, we have had dozens and probably hundreds across all of the team discussions over 
the last year as well as all of the years that I think we have um, to be able to leverage into the space. And I think our fundamental understanding is that, you know, clarity of decision making, cleanness of process, and um, again, lowering what is required to be able to tell people if we're going to let them use the resource will um, overall expedite development and um, provide organizations with what the information they need to be able to do their long-term planning around it. And I guess, and Mitch or Amy, if you have other thoughts on um, on anything from stakeholders to that end, and if you don't, that's also fine. Just, just that also just reiterating, we're going to be doing more outreach and engagement as we go on. And really, this is an introduction to you all. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing for some partners, this is an introduction for them too. And we will, uh, we're excited to, to talk to some of them and kind of hammer out some of the specifics, you know, specifically thinking about what those thresholds look like, what the timing looks like, um, you know, some of the more kind of, yeah, detail oriented things uh, kind of hammer that out. But um, yeah, early days, and we will be engaging a lot more uh, throughout the rest of the year. Uh, Natasha, you, uh, one last thing. You reminded me about this. I This is way downstream, um, but I wonder if uh, how we're going to deal with uh, unmet expectations when someone clears the very low bar of, look, is it possible that you could be a partner with us for funding? Yes, of course it's possible. And then over a period of time, it becomes clearer and clearer that no, for a variety of reasons, nobody's fault. This is not going to be a project. And um, this is, you know, I mean, this is further out, uh, but just thinking about what we will do to respond with people who have uh, built expectations because you, we said first, uh, sure, we're interested, talk to us. And then in the end, it doesn't result in anything and sort of finding that balance point between once you get in, there's a high likelihood that you're in. And once you get in, there's no promise that you're in and um, finding that spot. And I could imagine, you know, we've been in uh, not this situation because we haven't been uh, in this framework uh, yet, but we've been in a situation where uh, a project and developers and people have come back and said, well, look, I've done everything you wanted me to do and you still won't, you know, fund my project or come in. And I can just imagine that we're gonna have to deal with some of that as we continue to move down this process. Absolutely. And I think that that is, um, needs to be an explicit, um, uh, I guess, layer of policy and expectations as we do this. I think part of the, um, the design and function of the ORCA is to tolerate that. And so I think if you are selected from this, you would be have a timeline where you need to be able to submit your full impact assessment to be able to meet that evaluation. If you then realize, find that you can't meet the standards or you're unable to do it on that timeline, we say thank you, you go back in line and you can submit again. Again, it's not a all, you know, it's not less of a right now, like as we had NOFAs again, there was this, you know umbrella of competition. We were unable to be having the generative conversations as projects were actually kind of experiencing projects. And um, and if we have to say you're not performing, it was a, we'll see you in a few years when you want to compete again. Now we have a structure where we can say, you need to submit this with by X date. This is, you know, you have this, we'll talk to you about it as you do. Um, and then we will evaluate it. Are you meeting the standards? Do we have questions? We'll ask you questions. And then you have the more um, formal conditional commitment or LOI that then has another layer of the next um, expectations around timing and performance. Um, and so I think we do that out this way. And I think from a resource management hat, we're going to meet, need to be um, a little sophisticated in the way that we offer resources so that we don't lose funds to the state. So if we have a tax credit that needs to be spent by X date or have the project placed in service by X date, we might overdo it, like do a little bit over our skis, knowing that we can always pull from the next year if we need to, but that we don't want to risk not meeting um, not deploying all of the resources that we have. So I think there'll be some strategy, like there will be strategy there that does that. But I think, again, not wanting to say once we get you selected, it's all a free road there. It is, 
now you are in the queue where you know you're, we are telling you ahead of time what our needs and expectations are. We are here to support you meeting them, but we are not here to let our standards and expectations go. And I think those are, that's this balance of the performance and support that, you know, is trying to be stricken through the ORCA, which I'm really excited for. And again, we are all building our practice and muscles around it as we go. All right, Council Member Mania. Thank you, Chair Hall. Um, it's great information. Definitely love the direction that this is going. And, and I think it provides a lot of more transparency in terms of the process. If I understand it correctly, I just want to make sure that I do is that um, on this 9%, uh, it has to go through a selection process. We'll probably get that. And in the past, projects had to come in with a lot of, you know, uh, design already completed 70% and to be able to compete and all of those things, which is a lot of expense to not to, to our partners. Um, now, if I understand it correctly, is it's okay to come in with a concept in this selection process, provided that um, the priorities that have been identified in the QAP are this the selected projects would align with the, within those priorities. And once they are selected, depending as to how much information has been received in that application, whether it's the old type of submission that has a lot of information or, or, or not, it goes then once they've been selected, it goes into the ORCA process and falls in line whatever that stage that is in. Um, is that correct? Yeah, I think that, that that feels right. I mean, I think it'll it's probably more than a paragraph on a page what the project sure. is, right? So it'll be, and I think as we have seen, again, we have many that are sitting in our intake waiting for the resource to be available. So I think we'll probably start out with some really fully baked projects that have been on desks for a while. But I think that over time, as projects you know, are identifying what the right fit is, you know, can work with our the application team and the advisor team to kind of get that insight and perspective. What you know, how much is in the wait? You know, waiting on this versus that, and what's a good resource that fits this project. So we'll be able to do all of that stuff um, through that uh, intake process. But that, yeah. So you're not a you're not that evaluation and the selection process is not requiring copies of all of the documentation, all of the diligence, all of that to be done. And so whether that's work that's underway or they're gonna wait for the, yes, you're selected, so then you mobilize to do it. I think we'll need to have parameters around once you're selected, you know, within a time period, you need to be gathering and providing all of those so that we can do the more comprehensive impact assessment to do that. But I think it again, lowers the um, kind of financial and like output required for organizations to even be considered. And I think, um, and so I think, I think overall I'm saying yes. <laughs> and uh, that, um, that it is, yeah, it's a, a more of a balance wanting to not do competition that requires all of the stuff when we know we have standards around all of the things. So just a quick follow-up question then. Then the, the question to us and in this QAP process is really what are those priorities? Yeah. What are those? Were they, and then you mentioned oh, definitely more units. We, we, do we want that to be a kind of a standard that the more units in relation to what? That would be my question, you know, because obviously there's restrictions on site, restriction on zoning, all of those things. But um, in community need, what I would say, um, Definitely tying it to the housing needs analysis that each city and each region has done, I think makes a lot of sense uh, because that ha work has been done, has been submitted to the state, has been approved by the state and cities and jurisdictions have to perform to that. Um, but I, I get it. Thank you. Hey, do we have any further discussion? If uh, if not, I can. I have one other uh, topic here to, <laughs> to to show you, and I think this will be a little swifter. It's the okay. four percent tax credit, um, and so this is again, this is a tax credit generated in a different way. It's based on private activity bonds. Um, we have gone. We had 
more recently gone to the place where it was oversubscribed and so have the prioritization process in place. I think for understanding and awareness, we are continuing to manage the resource. And so I will just share here, um, this was information that we provided to the private activity bond committee meeting. Um, I guess it, I was going to say earlier this month, but it was actually in July, <laughs> um, not just yesterday, um, around where we are right now with the resources that OHCS have, has available through private activity bonds. Um, private activity bond committee does have a modest amount of resources remaining at committee. And so um, depending on how all of these projects work through, we will need to request the additional resources to cover um, the projects that we intend to fund. So you can see here um, the projects that are uh, uh, closed through July. We have uh, all of the this stack of projects that are closing in August, which you have uh, at this point, I think, approved the slate of projects um, closing this month. Um, and in you know, and so we'll be continuing to bring these as we go through the next couple of months. Um, there are a couple, uh, a few projects. It's, three-ish projects that we have that are not currently meeting readiness. And again, this was a place where we were, um, have had lots of conversations over um, in this 4% space as well. How do we hold accountability? And I think moving forward in the future, the ORCA provides a lot more bounds and a lot more places to do that more meaningfully, but we are still applying that process that we addressed at the time here. So we have a few projects that are not meeting readiness. Um, largely the readiness is around um, funding gaps at this point. And so we are trying to discern and decide, figure out getting information from those projects within the framework of our last gap resources to see what we have solvents for and what we don't. And where we don't have solvents, we will um, request these projects. So we're doing some remedy that I've issued, we've issued remedy letters to say, these are the needs, these are expectations, this is what needs to be solved and by when. So we will um, be able to understand if those projects are going to continue to move forward or need to resubmit through the ORCA to be able to access resources into the future. So I think that's just really a snapshot of, this is what oversubscription looks like. This is how we are managing this. We are also approaching um, I guess we're into the second half of this calendar year, we need to look towards 2025 and build out our closing calendar for 2025. After we give a commitment of private activity bonds to generate the 4% tax credits, there's usually at least six months of hard work that's required to do that, to line all of that closing stuff that up. So the idea that we need to be making those decisions sooner rather than later is real so that we can be understanding how much of the next year's resources will be fully subscribed and what remains, if any, that needs to be um, brought in new projects with gap funding. So I think this is this moment of time. And as we're looking at aligning the 4% tax credits into the ORCA, we're really looking at what remains in 25 and it's really 2026 resources from the um from the um from private activity bonds and from when that money will get need to be drawn because that's the the diff like the distinction there is that that time is explicitly about when it closes and so knowing that we have at least a six months ramp for projects that already have funding to it for these projects that we're talking about that are concepts or needing to apply and get their gap funding, that's probably a year and a half at least to be able to get everything lined up to do it. So we're looking forward. Um, and I think to the, you know, to Council Member Lee, your former, your comment on the 9% and what happens if it drops out, I think this credit is another place where we're going to need to be fairly um, sophisticated in our internal modeling and kind of tolerance of maybe getting a little bit over our skis in places to make sure that um, and have strategies for if we're over our skis and everything moves fine, we'll be able to do something to pull the funds forward to do it. But that if a project does, you know, has a funding gap and can't move forward any longer, we'll have something to pull there. Um, so I think um, uh, in the next, uh, I would say within the next month will be, um, I think the TFC Mitch nodding. So I think that looks feasible. We'll be um, putting out the information for projects that have all of their resources committed and are waiting on the 4% tax credits. 
to be able to use our existing QAP to prioritize those investments and we can get them into the pipeline. Um, and um, we'll need to see, are there remaining resources that we know we need to be talking to you about programming those as we do this update um, into the ORCA. Um, but uh, so I think next steps on the 4%, again, broad engagement, most certainly deliberate work with our um, prioritized partners and the local um, other public funders and notably the housing authorities who are um, a robust infrastructure of housing and producers of housing across the state. So we wanna make sure that we're um, working to support all of those and transition those um, policies into a process that can do the work of the ORCA that balances again pipeline management and support with accountability and making sure that we can deliver resources. Um, and so knowing that I think we've probably gone well over our time, I think maybe I will just uh, like just is that, say that if there's any critical thoughts that you have, um, certainly welcome them. Uh, but I might just do our next slide, which is just the QAP timing and next steps. Um, we are uh, moving into engagement, looking externally, again, kicking off here. We'll be sharing our engagement calendar uh, with stakeholders um, within, you know, this month, um, seeking to finalize a QAP update to be able to let us deploy these resources as, as um, well as possible, continuing to evolve and update it as we need um, so that we can be implementing it. And the next steps for um, Housing Stability Council plan to bring this conversation back in September, um, building off this information, which uh, was really helpful. So I appreciate it and um, continue to do that engagement externally um, and be able to bring back more about what we are hearing as we have, are doing those conversations. Um, but I think that is uh, the end of this uh, presentation, Chair Hall. If there's any other thoughts or uh, needs that council members have they would like to share now or in a follow-up, we would welcome it. Hey, anybody from the council have an immediate thought or comment? If not, we will look for, we will say thank you, Natasha and team, and we'll look forward to next time around. And let's see, it is 11-11. And this is the time in the agenda we have for a 15 minute break. So let's start that right now. Okay, are we ready to go folks? Well, I'm going to assume we are, and now we will hear from the Home Ownership Division. And <clears throat> before, actually, before we do, uh, we need to open a public hearing on the transactions that we are going to be considering. Again, this is a public hearing under uh, ORS 456.561. Is there anybody who wishes to offer comments on these projects we're about to take up. Hearing none, I will turn it over now to the Home Ownership Division. Are we ready to go, folks? Yes. Great. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Hall, Director Bell, and esteemed council members. My name is Cable Jiscombe, and I serve as the Director for Home Ownership. My pronouns are he, him, and his. The Home Ownership Program team will be presenting projects for your collective approval today. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Jessica McKinnon, who will be speaking next. Thank you for your time and attention. Great, good morning. Uh, one moment while I share my screen. Okay. Great. Well, good morning and thank you for having me today. I'm Jessica McKinnon. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Senior Homeownership Development Program Analyst with OHCS. I'm here today to bring two new NOFA projects for your approval. 
As a quick summary, we launched this rolling NOFA in January this year with 40 million lift and 5.2 million lift supplemental. To date, Housing Stability Council has awarded close to 26 million in lift and 4.5 million lift supplemental to 12 projects, totaling 203 units. Today, we're recommending two new projects for 3.78 million lift funding that will total 38 units. If you approve both projects today, we'll have a little more than 10.4 million lift and 628,000 lift supplemental still available. We'll be accepting applications for these remaining funds until September 2nd, and we'll expect to bring any additional applications to you in November. So far, we have received uh, one new application for evaluation, and then the pre-applications you see here are those that haven't yet submitted a full application, but also haven't let me know um, if they are not going to apply this year. Overall, we have been very pleased with the turnout for this year's NOFA, both from our familiar partners who work with us regularly, as well as all of the new partners who have applied and been awarded. Uh, the first project I'd like to I'd like to present is from a familiar face. Duke Street Townhomes is a new development by Habitat for Humanity Portland Region. It will be eight two to three bedroom units across two quadruplexes. Each unit will cost about five hundred thousand to build and will sell for a little more than two hundred sixteen thousand. This project is being supported by ARPA funds from the Portland area, and we're recommending to provide one million two hundred forty thousand lift. This project represents a little bit of innovation from Habitat Portland. Uh, typically, they'll do all of their construction in-house, which means there's a, a limit on their capacity. This development will instead be constructed through a private partnership with DBS Group so they can expand that capacity and build even more affordable housing. Even with this change, the project will use designs familiar to Habitat Portland and will include many of the same features, including being Earth Advantage Platinum Certified, solar ready electric and heat pumps. This site is well located near grocery and pharmacy and the site is across the street from Brentwood Park, which is a 14 acre park with many amenities. Habitat Portland is committed to serving households that are underrepresented as homeowners, specifically those in the BIPOC community. Outside of their outreach network through culturally specific and culturally responsive organizations, Habitat Portland has recently committed to two major initiatives the Advancing Black Homeownership Initiative has brought in a consultant to evaluate and improve the organization's ability to serve Black households, and an ITIN lending initiative helps support homeownership for buyers who may not have a social security number. Their data does show their methods have an impact, with 75% of their households identifying as part of the BIPOC community. Oh, goodness. Um, our second project is sponsored by a new partner, Northwest Community Housing Foundation, um, NWCHF, but included a, includes a larger development team. So the city of Redmond took part in the state's pilot program that allowed cities to expand their urban growth boundary for the purposes of housing. They put out an RFP and ultimately selected a plan from Edlin & Co. and to Chase Mexis. This plan will include 450 mixed income homes of different housing types and will include multiple sections of affordable housing in partnership with different affordable housing developers. This is that first phase sponsored by NWCHF, developed by Edlin & Co. and in partnership with Rooted Homes. This project will be 30 duplex units of two to three bedrooms up to 1,200 square feet. Each unit will cost about 440,000 and sell for 296,000. And we recommend providing this development 2,540,000 lift. Homes will be built to rooted homes designs and will be carbon neutral, net zero homes with solar panels, forced air and central AC. The site will include a playground, a fruit tree area and a community garden and home buyers will also receive an electric bike. Rooted Homes will manage the home buyer outreach and selection and will take over as the CLT once the homes are built. We have uh, presented on Rooted Homes earlier this year. They scored very highly on the equity section of their applications and have an extensive strategy for outreach and engagement, including a paid community working group and a standing partnership with Housing Works that allows them to provide homes for households with, with a housing voucher. Their data also shows that their outreach methods are quite equitable with 57% of their households identifying as part of the BIPOC community and 71% as first generation homebuyers. 
And with that, I want to thank you again for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Question, <clears throat> excuse me, questions, comments, feedback. Councilmember Lee. Thank you, Chair Hall. Uh, thank you, Jessica, for the uh, presentation. And I want to just appreciate the team. I had a request for uh, the information to come in a more visually uh, accessible uh, format. And I really appreciated that uh, you all were able to deliver that. It was super helpful to understanding the details of the project and this presentation. Uh, was also very helpful in terms of understanding quarter the high level uh, details of it. So thank you very much. And I'm really excited about both of these projects. Thank you. Anybody else on the council want to weigh in? Council member Mania. Thank you, General. I just echo what uh, council member Lee just mentioned. This are exciting. I mean, I, the, the housing opportunities and the seeing the number of, of housing home ownership opportunities that have been built uh, with these resources, it's amazing, it's great. And it's great to see um, uh, love all the activity and the money's getting now, so good job. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I believe we will close the hearing if we didn't do so already and then move to a vote. So moved. Thank you. Second. Roll call, please. Thank you, Chair Hall. Mm -hmm. Council Member Farrell. Yes. Chair Hall. Yes. Council Member Lee. Yes. Council Member Mena. Yes. Council Member Rogers. Yes. Council Member Harris. Yes, these are exciting. Thank you. Council Member Rodriguez. Yes. Thank you. Motion passes. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I'll circle back to Director Bell just quickly, see if there's any final thoughts, messages for the good of the order. Uh, appreciate that, Chair Hall. Maybe one thing I'll just mention more broadly, this is not to spark a conversation at this point, but maybe sometime soon as part of the reflection. Councilmember really, as I was listening to you and uh, Councilmember Mena around the layout, and I am really appreciative for both for the feedback on it. I think we want to continue to check to make sure how the vehicle by which we present is most uh, helpful and, and laying out the key points. And uh, certainly appreciative to the team for continuing to Take, take that on and, and to be responsive to that. And um, one of the areas that I think we want to continue to check on, uh, not just internally, but get partner feedback on, is um, um, the manner in which we sort of take information from a particular application, any application, not just home ownership. Uh, and when there is a culturally specific partner wanting to make sure that we are doing our own due diligence to make sure that we are accurately representing those partnerships and roles and responsibilities. So I just want to name that that is a place of learning for all of us, myself uh, included, to make sure that there is a check and balance uh, to that. I think partnership can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people and uh, and know that there's a lot of good intent in the partnership and I think that's manifested in progress. But just know there is some, some learning we are doing there and checking in with partners on how we can make sure fidelity to how we are describing the partnerships and also um, where those learnings are maybe learning into where we maybe um, uh, can be clearer to make sure that we're both accurately representing the work, the share of the work, the resources, and bringing that uh, as full to, to council. So, uh, Chair Hall, those aren't words of wisdom, uh, probably more learnings, but um, just appreciate the, the team's continue, uh, continuous focus to that and, and feedback. And I'll leave it to you to close us out for today. All right, then I'll say thank you very much, everybody involved in today's meeting. Great discussion, great work. Uh, and if you don't think summer's uh, flying by, just remember that the next time we see each other, it will be after Labor Day. Yeah, I know. Well, thank you again. And until then, we stand adjourned.